Hi, good afternoon. My name is Joanna Nelson and I'm with the New Mexico Economic Development Department. And you have tuned in today to an ongoing EDD webinar series where we highlight and focus particular programs that are available to help small businesses and communities. And today we're really honored to be here with an, a really important partner of ours, the New Mexico Finance Authority. And they are going to be addressing the Small Business Recovery Loan Fund and providing updates and information about how to apply. So before we get started, I did wanna let you know that we are recording this presentation. We will post this to our Facebook page as well as YouTube. We do know that there's an important press conference going on by the governor and her staff, I think right now. So apologies about that. We booked this, this webinar before we knew that there was a conflict in time. So if you do have to jump off and watch that, perfectly fine. We will send the link out to the recording as well as the presentation. If you do have questions, please type those in the questions box. You should, should see that in the right side of your screen. There's a little gray horizontal box that says questions. Type those as they come to you and we will address those at the end of the presentation. We also got your questions when you registered, so we'll do our best to get to those at the, the end. I did want to provide a bit of information about the Economic Development Department really briefly let you know that our cabinet secretary is Alicia J. Keyes. Our deputy cabinet secretary is John Clark. You can see the divisions that are in our department. They include economic development, film, outdoor rec, New Mexico Border Authority, Office of Military Base Planning, Spaceport Authority, and Main Street. I mentioned that this webinar is a part of an ongoing webinar series. And here on this slide, you can see some upcoming events and information sessions that we have planned for the fall and winter. So our next event will be the Rural Efficient Business Program. This will be on October 29th, and we will be highlighting energy efficiency practices from uh, rural businesses all across the state. And this interview will be with Noisy Water, who is located in Rio Doso, New Mexico. Also, next webinar is November 18th. We'll be highlighting what a COG is, which stands for Council of Government, and how they are helping with COVID-19 recovery and strategic planning. And then also, November 20th, we have the uh, EDD mini-series, specifically for business owners of color. And this session will be focusing on what is a CDFI, and a credit union and how they can be utilized to help find financing for businesses. And then we have an event coming up that will focus on the southern part of the state. This will be our business finance fair and this will be uh, December 9th. And what this will be is if you are a business looking for financing, we will invite all of the lender organizations in the southern part of the state or associations or, or organizations that assist with businesses to find financing. And this will be a, a remote virtual event. So online, they will be giving a, a small brief pitch about what they do, what services they offer, and hopefully businesses can connect with them and find opportunities for financing. As well, one more mention, our collateral assistance program is open. This is a program that can help uh, to have additional collateral on your commercial loan project. If you do have a deficiency in your, your commercial loan, we can assist with collateral by providing a CD. So if you have any questions about any of these, please contact us or go to these links. And here is a slide that shows our EDD regional reps. We have reps in all of these regions of the state. These are the boots on the ground of our department and can help answer any questions and connect you to resources through our department or partners like NMFA as well. So I want to turn it over to Marquita Russell with the New Mexico Finance Authority and 
Marquita, you should have the ability to share your screen. All right, give me a second here. I think. All right, do I have it? You've got it. Take it away. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you, Joanna, for uh, hosting us today. We very much appreciate the opportunity uh, to uh, tell a little bit about the Small Business Recovery Loan Fund. Again, my name is Marquita Russell. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the New Mexico Finance Authority. And uh, joining me today is Adam Johnson, who is our Chief of Program Operations. We're going to go through uh, today how you, the the basics of the program, how you access the application, how you can use the application, um, and you know where you can find frequently asked questions, that sort of thing. But we don't want you to lose fact, uh, uh, sight of the fact that we are here to answer your questions. If you have any questions about your specific forms that you need to file or how your business may differ from the program and whether you still qualify, please give us a call. Um, I've got here on, my, our, on the screen our telephone number in Santa Fe, which is 505-984-1454 or toll free 1-877-ASK-NMFA. We're here to answer your questions. Um, we are working remotely, so it, we will get you to a person uh, that can answer your questions. But if you have a, you know, if you're working during the day, as most New Mexico business owners are, and you're doing this at night, and there may not be a person available to answer your call, you can send us an email at recovery at nmfa.net, and we'll be able to respond to you very quickly. We have a number of people uh, manning that particular email box. Uh, and then lastly, there are some helpful uh, tips and tools on the website, which is uh, nmfinance.com. So with that, let me get started with the actual specifics of the Small Business Recovery Loan Fund. <clears throat> the, this particular fund was created by the state as part of the 2020 special session. It was signed into law by Governor uh, Lujan Grisham on July 7th, 2020. We opened the program. 29 days later on August 5th. The program itself is a $400 million uh, loan program that offers low interest rate loans to businesses and nonprofits that experienced financial hardship uh, due to the public health order, particularly those that got hit hard in those early months of uh, April and May. The loan itself is a three year loan. It can be used for a variety of um, uh, expenses. It does not have any personal guarantee requirements. There's no collateral required. We don't do an underwriting on your business um, and you don't have payments for the first year. <clears throat> to date we've provided loans of more than I think to more than 500 businesses um, from all corners of the state and we have a lot of uh, capacity to make more loans. And so we're here to answer your questions to make certain uh, this is, uh, to find out whether or not this is a really good fit for you. Uh, industries that have done very well in the program so far are restaurants, hotels, um, uh, art uh, galleries, things like that. The loans will range in size up to $75,000. And we'll go through this, the specifics in a little bit, but it's based on your, average monthly expenses, um, but the smallest loan we've made so far is $496. So there's no loan too small. Um, so, you know, feel free to apply. Um, another specific thing is that you can um, qualify for the program, even if you've already gotten CARES Act funding. There's a lot of concern or question about if you accessed either the PPP program at the very beginning of the uh, public health order or you um, were successful in getting an idle loan through the SBA that does not take you out of the running for this loan program. And then lastly, you can prepay your loan at any time. There are no fees or penalties. Um, and if at the end of the three-year period, you can't um, make the full principal payment or any portion of the principal payment, we can then kick out those payments for an additional three years. So this really does provide you with a bridge um, to where to when your um, business operations will normalize. 
So under the statute, um, an eligible business is a New Mexico business that closed or reduced operations due to the public health order and had annual gross revenues of less than $5 million as determined by the 2019 federal tax, uh, federal tax return and experienced that 30% decline um, in the monthly receipts for April and May of 2020 as compared to those same months in 2019. New Mexico business can be either a for-profit business um, and any version of a for-profit is eligible, or it can be either a 501c3 nonprofit, that would be a charitable organization, or a 501c6 nonprofit, and that would be a, um, an association like a chamber of commerce. Uh, one of the eligibility requirements is that you uh, demonstrate that you are a New Mexico business, that you are owned and controlled by New Mexico residents. So if you are a sole proprietor, you need to um, demonstrate that you 100% of the assets of the business are either owned or leased by a New Mexico resident. Um, if you are another kind of for-profit business, then we need to see that at least 80% of the voting power and control um, resides with New Mexico residents. And for purposes of this statute, New Mexico resident is defined as an individual who's domiciled in the state um, for any part of the year or someone who's physically present in the state for 185 days or more during the taxable year. So the loans uh, themselves, the terms are set out very clearly in statute. Um, you can qualify for two times your monthly average expenses, not to exceed $75,000. The interest rate is half of Wall Street Journal Prime, uh, which currently puts that interest rate at 1.625%, and that'll be fixed during the life of the loan. As I said earlier, there are no collateral requirements. There's no personal guarantees. These are three-year loans with interest due annually, and the principal due at the end of the third year. And again, as I mentioned earlier, if there's a need to extend the payments at the end of that third year, you have the option of extending them for an uh, additional three years, at which point you start making these principal and interest payments monthly. So how does this work? Um, let's say you have a coffee shop and you Obviously, we're, we're closed during most of April, if not all of April and May, and you need to continue to stabilize. Um, we're going to get a copy of your 2019 tax returns, and we're, you're going to need to list your total expenses, and that includes your cost of goods sold. And as Adam will show you in a minute, the application itself, depending on the kind of business you are, he can tell you in the application which business which tax form you're going to and what line items you're looking at. Um, but in this instance, we have a $300,000 uh, total expense. We've put down $10,000 for depreciation, and we received early on a $50,000 PPP loan. So you'll see here that we have our total expenses, less depreciation, because that's a non-cash item, um, and less the CARES Act loan to get you your total adjusted expenses, divide by 12 and we get our average monthly expenses of $20,000. <clears> so your loan amount in this particular instance would be two times that or $40,000. Again, your interest rate is uh, fixed at half of prime rate, which is 1.625. So this is what your scheduled payments would look like. At the end of the first year, which would be, let's assume you close on November 1st, uh, end of the first year would be uh, $650, and that's an interest-only payment. A year later, November 1st of 2022, you have another $650 payment. And then again, at the end of the third year, you have not only your $650 payment, but also the $40,000 principal that was borrowed on November 1st of 2020. Again, you can extend those payments. And in this instance, if you were to extend the payment, you keep that 1.625 interest payment and you would have 36 months of monthly principal and interest payments totaling about $1,140, mas hermanos. Um, at any point that you wanna prepay a portion of that loan, you're able to do that. That would obviously change either your interest payment or uh, the amount of principal you do at the end. So that's how that works. Um, 
that's how you know how much you can qualify for. Uh, the application, which Adam's going to walk you through, is accessed through our website, which is uh, www.nmfinance.com. The application will be open according to the, the law until December 31st of 2020. A couple of important things to note, which is that this application system, which is very easy to use, is unfortunately not able to save your work. So you need to make certain that you have available at the time you start this, the documents you're gonna need and uh, you know enough time to complete the application. Um, if you are eligible, you're your loan process takes approximately 10 days. Uh, we've done it much faster than that. And we've, I think we've funded them in as little as two days. Um, de just depends on when you submit your application. Uh, we fund twice a week. So 10 days is a really good gauge. Um, but if you're ineligible, you'll be notified as you complete the application or very shortly thereafter. Um, and again, please call us if you have any questions. We have people that are now very well versed in all of the tax forms that you're using and can help uh, point you to the right numbers and, and give you some really good advice. So the uh, documents you're gonna need, again, your 2019 business federal, uh, your federal tax return, uh, copies of the reports that you submit to the New Mexico Taxation and Revenue Department. And these are the ones that reflect uh, the receipts for the month of April and May of uh, 2019 and 2020, because we're going to be looking for a 30% decline from both April to April and then again from May to May. So those four months. If you um, report monthly, that'll be four reports. If you report quarterly, you would be report. You would send us your um, your fourth quarter. April and May is reflected in your fourth quarter for 2019 and 2020. Um, or actually, I'm sorry, that's second quarter calendar year. Um, for nonprofits, you would actually submit uh, your, um, your uh, financial statements that show your profit and loss for the fiscal years that include those months. And, um, nonprofits obviously have different fiscal years, so just make certain that it includes the months of April and May of 2019 and 2020. You'll need to show us copies of your CARES Act loan. This is to help make certain that you haven't um, somehow uh, overstated uh, what's due. We ask that you put that in there so that we can help you calculate the right amount. We have found more often than not that people have put down too much in that loan in that item. Uh, line item. And then lastly, your personal income tax returns. And this is for anyone that has an equity ownership in it. And that's to demonstrate that um, residency requirement that we talked about earlier. You're going to be required to have a checking account at a federally insured financial institution at the time that you um, submit the application. It needs to be in the name of the, uh, of the applicant of the business. Um, and we will be using a system called PLAID, which is a fully secured and encrypted system that allows us to verify that the account is valid and is held in the name of the applicant. We certainly wouldn't want someone pretending to be you to go in and uh, have that money diverted someplace else. So this is a really important part to keep both you as a business owner and us as the lender um, uh, out of any fraud situation. So we, this is an important element for, for fraud mitigation. Um, and again, if you don't meet the loan qualifications, you'll be prompted to um, continue to submit the information so that we can capture some really important information to give back to policymakers, the lawmakers. Um, you know, at the end of this, they'll want to report as to who was able to qualify and who wasn't. And if you weren't able to qualify, why? Um, so this, it's important that you uh, give us as much information as you can, if you're, even if you're ineligible, so that we can um, maybe help get that program broadened for you in the future. And then lastly, the system that Adam's going to walk you through here in a minute, um, Formstack, is a fully secure system and is, uh, uses only encrypted um, uh, it encrypts the documents as it goes, and your loan application itself and elements of your loan application are not subject to any sort of public disclosure. The only thing that we um, can disclose are the names of the loan recipients, and then everything else is done in broad demographic terms. 
So with that, Adam, I am going to attempt to change it to you for the next part. Thank you, Marquita. Let me grab my screen here. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir, we can. Great. Thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon to go over the Small Business Recovery Loan Fund and the um, <clears throat> application process that I'm happy to share with you today. And what you see on my screen at the moment is actually the landing page for the Small Business Recovery Loan Fund application. I wanted to start here to show you the links and some, a bunch of additional useful resources that we've uh, provided for applicants to make it successfully through the process. So you can see the application is available in both English and Spanish. Um, we have a number of different uh, frequently asked questions as well as very easy to use videos as we all know most of our uh, eyeballs tend to uh, lean towards videos these days versus reading so we uh, provided some of that uh, on this <clears throat> page for folks to use to learn how to apply for the uh, uh, the loan fund and also how to connect their bank account uh, we've also got some additional resources with regards to uh, reducing pdfs and other useful tips and tricks. Um, all of that is great, but none is better than a real human to help you walk through the process. So uh, do make sure that you keep that phone number and email handy. And we do have folks standing by to take questions and help you through the process. Uh, we've designed a process with uh, efficiency and fraud mitigation in mind. Um, that said, <clears throat> we are by no means using algorithms to make decisions here, and we are standing by to help folks through this process. Um, now, uh, on my screen is a is a link I opened directly from the website to the loan application. Um, we we do our best right from the beginning to communicate to the applicant uh, not only uh, the documents that are required depending upon the formation of the organization, but also even just the amount of time that we would hope that you would set aside to allocate to this process. As Marquita mentioned, um, one of the drawbacks, if you will, of this particular um, uh, platform, because it's got a comprehensive workflow process related to it, is you cannot save the application. Now, that said, um, we've had incredible feedback from folks that this application is uh, very user-friendly. Um, and generally takes much less than the estimated time that we've uh, provided in the instructions here as you sit down to get ready. Again, we've uh, provided the various documents uh, listed here that you would need in order to be successful in the application. Um, and in fact, the very first question will ask you whether or not you have everything that you need to proceed with the application. Uh, in a few instances, we do get um, some answers to this question, which is no. Um, and if that is the case, then most of the application actually disappears and asks you to come back at another time. You'll see a similar theme as the application proceeds on uh, with respect to the specific qualification requirements from the statute of the Small Business Recovery Act. Um, the next question asks the applicant whether or not they are for profit or non profit, and then uh, proceeds to the type of formation that that nonprofit or for profit business is. Um, after this question is answered, the application will take a specific form to, uh, to guide the user to get the correct documents um, and the specific places on those documents to be entered into the application. Of course, um, we do have folks <clears throat> available to help should that process not go perfectly. Um, but our hope is that uh, we've communicated pretty clearly with the applicants as to everything that they need to be able to fill in. The next uh, field, because I've chosen an S corporation, is to answer the question about whether or not the uh, corporation is uh, controlled and owned by at least 80% New Mexico residents. Uh, once you answer yes to this question, it will proceed to ask you who the names of the uh, officers and owners of the corporation are. And in this case, in my hypothetical example, I've got <clears throat> Mr. and Mrs. Stiles, they're a couple, uh, Megan and Jonathan, uh, they own a company called 
M&J Styles Inc. Their business is Styles Salon. Um, as you'll note that uh, some of the uh, fields, the majority of the fields in the application are required fields. Uh, you'll find just a couple that are not required and those are designated by an asterisk that I wish was a little more visible, but that is the asterisk there that uh, is denoting that the fields are required. Um, continuing on, we do collect, as you'll see throughout, a little bit of information that helps us understand the uh, where the Small Business Recovery Loan Fund is being used most across the state of New Mexico. In particular, <clears throat> we use the answer to the question about the county of physical location to gather um, some dem the beginning of some demographic demographic information. Um, <clears throat> continuing on with contact information, it is important. Uh, that the individual um, filling out the application be the authorized officer for the business. Um, this is important because one of the final questions and then corresponding uh, certifications should the loan be approved, there's questions uh, confirming that the ownership, uh, I'm sorry, that the authorized officer um, is who they say they are and that they are authorized to sign on behalf of the business. So uh, I point this out because uh, we often have folks that help us in our business life with uh, processes of this type. Um, and while I would not discourage uh, folks from leveraging their various resources to do that, it is important that the actual authorized officer be the person on the other side of the keyboard filling out the application and hitting the submit button. As we continue on, you'll notice that the revenue qualification um, with respect to the annual revenues not exceeding $5 million is the next question, and it's particular to the S Corps here. And you'll see that we provided uh, the specific form for the S Corp, the 1120S, uh, as it appears on page one, line one of that document to help you navigate those tax forms that we also also love and adore. Um, you'll note here, uh, similarly to the yes, no question about uh, proceeding and ownership, that if this number exceeds the 5 million, uh, the application will not allow the user to proceed, uh, but does encourage you to submit the information that it has gathered so far so that we have it. Um, in this case, <clears throat> Uh, Style Salon does uh, $500,000 in revenue. Um, there's a question about a technical service provider. This question is particular. There's language in the statute that provides for um, a portion of the fund to be used uh, to help a technical assistance provider <clears throat> do things for a business with respect to um, ongoing marketing, ongoing assistance with uh, bookkeeping, accounting, uh, legal aspects. What it's not designed for is necessarily to have a technical assistance provider do this process uh, on behalf of the applicant, but instead uh, is designed to, if you were to partner with somebody, perhaps at like a small business incubator um, or another individual that would sign up for this aspect of the program uh, to assist the business in the long run with various aspects um they, we we've not seen a lot of uh takers on on this portion of the program and the user of the application uh can just proceed by answering no to the question if the answer is yes then they are asked to provide the information related um to that individual or organization the next qualifying question is referred to as the revenue and decline qualification and uh, we have provided here um, a framework which is designed very closely along the language provided in the statute, but um, we have also expanded upon the uh, in, with this portion of the calculation with respect to the quarterly and semi-annual filers. However, we do ask the applicant to fill in these um, fields. Uh, regardless of the way that they file uh, with the information for the month. So if you were quarterly, you would take that quarterly report um, and divide it by three to get the numbers to provide into this field. If you were uh, semi-annually, you would divide it by six and put them into this field. Um, in the event that those averages are not working um, 
necessarily, maybe they're not as accurate, maybe an average is not accurate for those reports, <clears throat> meaning there's fluctuation contained within those months. We have staff available to help with the calculations once it's been submitted, but we do request that you would submit the information <clears throat> uh, either as provided for monthly reporters or on average for quarterly and semi-annual reporters uh, to help us get, a, get through the process. Um, at this point, you you can see that the application is doing the calculation on behalf of the applicant. Style Salon in April of 2019 did $100,000 in sales. In April of 2020, it was reduced by 80%. Uh, in uh, May of 2019 and 2020, the calculation is reduced by 90%. And so the applicant can continue to proceed with the uh, application with respect to qualification. Um, after those questions, that question is answered, uh, what occurs now going forward, and it was designed in mind to keep some information out of the system, in particular sensitive information, which would be a federal tax and uh, employer identification number or a social security number <clears throat> in uh, the case of a sole proprietorship. Um, and so this field appears now that the applicant has made it past the qualification questions. The, Following fields is the last area in which the application is doing the calculations, uh, providing specific instructions as it goes through, as Marquita demonstrated in the PowerPoint, how we um, come up with the what's referred to as the average adjusted monthly business expenses. And that's simply the total business expenses reported in 2019. Again, what we've done is provided the specific instructions as to how that appears on the tax return in this case it is on page one lines two and 20 it's the cost of goods sold along with the total deductions added together uh, we back out the amount for depreciation again the specific instructions are provided um, and then uh, lastly on question 20 we're looking for the uh, reduction if any related to either the payment protection loans that have been received or the idle loans that have been received. Um, the rest of this portion, these fields here are read only, but is doing the calculation on behalf of the applicant. In this case, what you can know is that the average adjusted monthly expense is just over 37,000. And when that's multiplied by two, it's 74,166. Uh, the application does know that if the amount exceeds 75,000, then the, uh, in this case, you can see if the loan amount from the PPP loan was 30,000 instead of 45, the adjusted expense goes up as does uh, two times that, but the maximum amount of the loan remains at 75,000. Uh, I realized I was hiding that field just a little bit. So I'll show you here in the case that it's less than 75,000, it actually populates the number that was calculated in this field right above. The following field is uh, related to the selection of, if any, uh, an institution that may be partnering with the finance authority to review the application. Uh, we've provided here a list of various <clears throat> institutions around the state that have partnered with the finance authority. Um, if you do not have an individual or a bank <clears throat> CDFI or credit union that you work with that's not listed here, uh, then you can just simply answer the question, my financial institution is not listed, and uh, the application will be processed by staff at the Finance Authority. If you do have a preference and your institution is listed, you can leave that there, and we have contact information for those folks at the authority. And, we get them involved in part of the review process. The anticipated use of funds fields, um, this, this area is a combination of uh, compliance as well as uh, simply picking up the data and the uh, estimated use of funds that the applicant foresees using the loan proceeds for. The, what's important to know, as Marquita discussed uh, in the slides in the PowerPoint, is it is required by law that no more than 20% in the case of a for-profit business be used for the salaries of equity owners of the company. Um, 
and more succinctly put that at least 80 percent of the loan proceeds are used for something other than salaries for the owners um, other than that what we're asking for is the uh, information so that we can uh, look at it from a reporting purpose we're not uh, in any way going to be uh, coming back and asking the uh, successful applicants to demonstrate that they met all of these targets in the future. Uh, we just want to know what the starting point is. Um, we come back in a different point in time to collect a survey on how it was actually used and, and make some comparisons and see if we can understand uh, any interesting statistics that may come out of this field, uh, these fields of questions. Uh, the, it, it continues on in a similar uh, fashion with respect to reporting. You will note that these fields are all required. The next section um, requests information about the total number of employees. As of March 1st of 2020, the total number of employees at the date of the application and then an estimate of employees in the future. Uh, certainly, we understand that uh, nobody has a crystal ball with respect to how many employees any business will have um, a year from now or in March of 2021. Uh, however, what we are trying to pick up is any kind of gauge of uh, optimism or pessimism um, throughout the state and again, have this information as a starting point and for reporting purposes. Uh, and that goes along the same lines for the industry codes as well as uh, any diverse business classification that might apply to the business. Um, lastly, we have a list of the, uh, a play, I'm sorry, not a list, but I guess it's a list, but it's also a place to attach the required documents. Uh, this helps our applicant reviewers, application reviewers, um, essentially compare what's been put into the application to the supporting documents. Each one of these fields is required, um, and there's a place, and these are specific to the type of application that's been received. As you'll note here, this is requesting an 1120S and the K-1 schedule for the S-Corp for Style Salon. Um, one of the things that we uh, need that is required for each one of these applications that makes it to the approval phase is that we do a what's known as a soft business credit check, not an individual credit check, but a business soft check. Um, this has no impact on the uh, credit score of a business, um, or it's simply a, a pull, a soft credit pull, uh, helping the finance authority look for any type of um, uh, uh, indicators on a credit report that would be in contrary to information provided in the, applic provided in the application, such as uh, tax liens, um, and or any evidence of any types of char charge-offs uh, related to three specific areas that we can discuss after we finish this demonstration. Demonstration. And so on this, this is a link here. This will take you actually to another form in which you can sign uh, the credit authorization form. You download that form um, after you receive a special PIN code to your email and then re-upload that form in the fields provided here. And then lastly, the certification statements. These statements um, are provided to the applicant so they understand what they are agreeing to. These are uh, statements, of, um, the exact same statements that are in the actual loan agreement. If the application is approved for funding, um, we wanted to provide these statements on the front end so that um, none of this is a surprise when you get to the funding and closing stage of the loan. Um, and lastly, and, uh, and, and maybe not most importantly, but certainly uh, a special consideration and note, we have a note here at the bottom about the next steps. Uh, upon completion of the application, the uh, applicant will immediately receive a automated, automatically generated email to the email address provided in the application um, it is going to give the user some information about how to track their application including the application request id number um, and also some specific instructions so that the applicant can securely uh, link their bank account to the application as you'll know 
so far in the application, we've not collected any bank information, and that's a specific design for security purposes that that would be picked up after the process. Um, once the applicant uh, receives that email, they would click on a link provided in it. Uh, this form here uh, requests a little bit of information in order to link the application to the uh, PLAID process, if you will. Um, in the PLAID process, I'll just take a moment to, to demonstrate just a little bit um, because we have had uh, various questions about this. We essentially are using an external third party to verify um, the bank information via a, a process kicked off by the applicant. So the finance authority um, has no access directly to the information provided. What we are doing is requesting that the applicant give authorization to this company known as PLAID to transmit the uh, secure banking information back to the finance authority. Um, this technology is pretty commonly used, although I would say PLAID is not necessarily a household name. Uh, you'll find this technology behind a lot of banking to banking relationships that you are already used to. Um, it's also commonly used for uh, processes like Venmo, um, and Zelle to uh, communicate and confirm the relationships between banks. Um, and so the finance authority has chosen this software and platform uh, to give the applicants and the finance authority uh, some peace of mind about the transmission of the data. Um, this, in this form, uh, it will take, take you to another secure site to provide uh, a couple of different ways of communicating the information. Um, after agreeing to provide this information back to the finance authority, um, it will allow you to choose your bank. Um, and we found that uh, the majority of New Mexico banks are uh, a part of uh, the uh, search engine, if you will, of, of this platform. Um, however, it's not necessary and we can use simply the routing and account information of the bank in order to uh, get the information. Um, if it is a partnering bank, uh, what it will do is, um, let's see, let me grab a quick one. Uh, trying to find one that's pretty common in New Mexico. Um, it will take you to a place to provide your banking credentials and upon successful link, it will take the information back over to the Plaid form. I'm sorry, back to the um, the banking form I just showed you, and then back to the application. Uh, we do have, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the ability, if that's unsuccessful, for you to follow another process to do what's called micro deposits, and that's here. Um, all of this information is back on our website under the how to connect your bank account securely video provided. And again, we're available for questions. And I think I'll stop there for other questions um, or anything you think I may have missed, Joanna or Marquita. Uh, I don't know that you missed anything. Let me get us back to the last page of our presentation. Um, okay, so that's this awkward moment of, I can't figure out how to get us back to our presentation. Um, <clears throat> the last page of our presentation really is just to remind folks that we have helpful tools at nmfinance.com, um, which uh, Adam just walked you through and showed you. Um, so please make certain that you um, check that website, look at all the links, um, again, there's uh, information available in both English and Spanish, so please let us know if you have additional questions. We're certainly willing um, and able and, and eager to help you get through that. So with that, um, I think we are ready for questions. I saw one question in the chat box um, about whether or not an EIDL loan is required to be um, deducted, and the answer is yes. Uh, the way that the lawmakers set up this loan, they wanted to um, uh, 
you were to deduct from your monthly your average <clears throat> expenses the amount of uh, monthly help you would have received from a uh, SBA loan, either the PPP or the EIDL, so that amount gets deducted. So you start with your expenses, including your cost of goods sold, you deduct out um, your depreciation and any uh, CARES Act loans that you received. Grants are fine, so you don't have to deduct out grants, but you have to deduct out the amount of loans that you received. And that was the one question I saw. Okay, great. Thanks, Marquita. Thanks, Adam. And I want to repeat that if you have questions, please put those in the questions box on the right side of your screen. And I've got some questions over here. One of them addresses uh, what the, the loan proceeds could be used for. And in this case, this is from Ezra. Can the loan be used for upgrading systems and moving forward and dealing in a COVID environment for business? And the answer is yes. Um, yes. So as long as it's related to operating your business and it's not more than, and no more than 20% is going to pay owners of the business, then you are eligible to use it as you see fit. Okay, thank you, Marquita. The next question that I had was, this person is, So I think we lost Joanna's volume here. Let me jump in to pick uh, up on questions that we're seeing here. Okay, um, great. Thanks, Adam. Sure thing. So one question we have is what would not qualify a business? Well, there are that's a really good question. So um if you are over five million dollars in annual revenues, you would be ineligible. Um, if you did not show, if you couldn't evidence decline um, for April and May of 2020 versus 2019, um, so you need a 30% decline in each of those months, that would also make you ineligible. And, or if your business wasn't at least 80% owned by New Mexico residents. So um, that's those are the three core ones. There's one additional thing that we would mention, which is that if you have outstanding tax liens that preceded the pandemic, those will need to be clarified, those will need to be cleared up before we're able to make a loan to you. And if you had uh, collection efforts in 2019, so we're not considering 2020, but 2019 from either a telecommunications, like your cell phone, uh, utilities, or rent, rent mortgage, those three items we're looking for business uh we're businesses that were put into collections um or were charged off um during 2019 for any one of those three creditors um so we're not looking for personal information it is business information so those would be disqualifying events okay and then we have a couple other series of questions with respect to the 30% uh, decline um, quarterly, semi-annually. So I'll try to take those those together. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier um, that we are able to process uh, any type of CRS report, whether it's monthly, quarterly, or semi-annually. Um, we do encourage you to take the uh, average of those in the event that it's quarterly or semi-annually to input into the application and then reach out to us and or you will certainly be hearing from us that's usually a um, one that we quickly turn around and have questions about um, uh, with respect to making sure that the uh, underlying uh, receipts of the business or uh, support those reports um, and so we we do have a way to get um, those types of reports uh, through the process and we've done so successfully on many occasions um, 
And so there's no need to request from TRD um, to convert anything from quarterly to monthly. We can we can do that with quarterly. Um, with respect to the uh, months that are required, the law is very specific to that the business uh, receipts be as evidence for April and May of 2019 and 2020 and the comparison. Um, where we are working closely with clients is in the event that the business is operating its accounting on a cash basis and say for example it did receive payments for services rendered in prior months and those have shown up in the reports um, we are working closely with businesses to see what other underlying documentation we can use to support to subtract those receipts from the uh, gross receipts tax report out of those numbers so that we can justify and see the decline and we just uh, make that a note in the system and have the underlying documentation. Um, we have had uh, a few instances in which a business did not start until after April and May of 2019 um, and in those instances uh, unfortunately we've not been able to get around the need for a report uh, and the decline to be evidenced um, but we have been making uh, many notes on these aspects of the law that have been challenging for New Mexico business owners um, and have a list of recommendations to make it more accessible, particularly along these lines of the revenue in decline qualifications. So it is it is noted and we are sharing that feedback um, as necessary uh, in hopes to get some changes made in the upcoming session. Great, thanks Adam, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Apologies about that. My audio cut out. I had another question that that came in that is from a person saying that they need assistance filling out the small business application. So where should they go? They should certainly uh, contact um, our offices. Um, we have uh, folks on staff that um, are uh, fluent in English and Spanish. Um, and so we're happy to uh, talk to them about the process and see what kind of challenges that they're having. Um, so I think that's the best place to start. Um, uh, in the event that they need more assistance than that, um, the staff that they would contact can, can point them in the direction of any technical service providers that have signed up. Um, I would also anticipate that whether or not some organizations like SCORE or the uh, various business incubators or chambers around the state haven't signed up, I'm sure they'd still be willing to, um, to help any business owner with the process. But I, I certainly would start with our team and the contact info provided in the slides. Thank you. And I do have to say the questions that come through our office via email that we connect to NMFA, the email response is pretty immediate that you're getting responses back to business owners. So I wanna encourage people to use that email. What was it, uh, can you repeat the email? Sure, it's recovery at NM, as in New Mexico, FA, finance authority.net. Great, thank you. We have a question from Kristen saying that her business is registered in Red River, but the headquarters are in Texas. Is this business eligible for the loan? I guess. Um, Could you repeat that question? Please, thank you. I think I missed that. The business is located in Red River? Yes. Is that what you said? And, yes, and the headquarters is in Texas. Is this still eligible? I, I would expect yes, because it's a business that's operating in Red River. They're paying Red River, they're paying gross receipts tax, so they would be you know, subject to it. The, the one question I would question, the one thing that would come up is whether or not the, um, they are 80% owned by New Mexico residents. So the fact that they may have headquarters, you know, someplace else, you'd need to be showing that you have New Mexicans owning the business, and otherwise you just are subject to the same 
taxation and revenue department uh, filings. Great, thank you. And one more question about this person has multiple companies. Can they apply for each company? So the, the short answer is yes. Um, what we would be looking for is the underlying uh, tax documentation, both at the federal level and the state level <clears throat> to show them as uh, separate in the case of their uh, uh, reporting for purposes of gross receipts tax. Um, and then to be able to um, see that the annual revenues uh, don't exceed the 5 million on an individual basis, uh, and also that we could get a clear picture of the expenses for purposes of the loan calculation also being individual. Okay, great. That sums up the questions that we got prior to the presentation. You guys did an excellent job at getting to a lot of the questions that we received prior. And I'm not seeing any additional questions that you haven't answered in the questions box. So, Marquita or Adam, would you like to add anything before we sign off? Um, just our, our thank you for um, joining us today. Again, nmfinance.com. Take a look at it. If you have any questions, please, please get in touch with us. Um, we really want to make certain that we're here if you need us. Um, and that's, that's our goal is to make certain that you know that you have the option of participating in this program. And I think that's what I would leave the folks with. How about you, Adam? I think that that's it. Um, I did see a couple of final questions come in about the idle loans and the PPP loans. Um, and just to, to clarify, um, we do need to uh, reduce the calculation by the amount that's in the promissory note. Uh, provided by SBA and the lending, the partner lending bank. However, um, we should specifically look at your case um, and make sure that we're getting that that done correctly when you put in your application. So please uh, put in the numbers as provided, and then staff will be in contact with you to make sure that we get it right. Great, thank you so much, and thank you, Marquita. Thank you, Adam, and thanks to the NMFA staff for all that you're doing. These guys are working tire tirelessly and doing a really great job at getting information out to businesses. So thank you so much for all your work and being such a great partner. So thanks all who attended. And if you have any questions for us, for NMFA, please reach out and we will assist you as best that we can. Thank you all. Be safe. and um, Thank you, Joanna. Thank you. You guys thank see you.